kept thinking that I was going to bring some images and it somehow did not happen because like that. Um, but um, in any case, we were like thinking about how to bridge uh, the conversation, where to stand, the stances to take. Um, and um, one of the things that came to mind is a very, very basic thing, but we have not done it yet. And that is perhaps let's go ahead and define the terms. So we keep talking about artificial intelligence. So maybe we take two steps back and we say, what do we define as intelligence, what do we define as artificial, what do we define as artificial intelligence. Let's just make sure we are all talking about the same thing, because often that's, uh, you know. Um, so um, uh, so uh, we, we split the definitions. Uh, uh, so here I am going to read to you, according to Mariam, Mariam Webster's, um, what is intelligence. And so we have here, it's not, it's not a very short definition, um, but we have uh, the definition of intelligence is A, the ability to learn or understand or to deal with new or trying situations. Uh, it's a mode of reason. Um, the, also the ability to apply knowledge to manipulate one's environment or to think abstractly as measured by objective criteria like tests. Also, mental acuteness. And um, in Christian science, it's the basic eternal quality of a divine mind. Uh, it's also a mode of information concerning an enemy or possible enemy on an area, or an agency engaged in obtaining such information. It's also the act of understanding. Also, the ability to perform computer functions. And a collection of uh, several intelligent minds is also an intelligence. And finally, you have something that it would be called uh, a supernatural divine entity. And so all those things uh, fall with, uh, within the, what can be considered intelligence. Then you go. So using the same resource, I looked at artificial, and it's a much shorter definition. It starts by saying that um, artificial, it's something that is not natural or real. It's made, produced, or done to seem like something natural, not happening or existing naturally created or caused by people. So if we were to pretty much put together artificial intelligence as a definition, what are we looking at from your perspective as an artist? Uh, I mean, well, it's clearly that, you know, then I would try to think, um, yeah, I would say, in in terms of what the buzzwords is, uh, is as is used by a, by a lot of people, I often don't see a lot of difference between um, artificial intelligence and what used to be called until a few years ago, big data. But that's, uh, and that's basically, as, so in that sense, I would say that we tend to use it to describe the possibility of crunch numbers and compute vast quantities of indiscriminate information to obtain a particular result. So it's a very um, narrow definition at the end, to which then I think we keep trying to uh, add supernatural qualities. We'll solve world hunger, we'll bring the divinity, we'll wake up and talk one day, we'll try to kill us. But it's, uh, you know, it's crunching power in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, um, in some respect, I feel the same way. On one of our, on one of our projects, we have developed an artificial intelligent algorithm that actually competed with the clinicians at one of the local hospitals in terms of um, outcome, diagnosis and treatment outcome. The outcome of this experiment was very simple. The physician group took about 42 minutes to come up with the next best step in treatment care for a particular patient, while our algorithm 
was pretty much waiting around because it took about two seconds for the same uh, optimization of care to be provided. So in terms of data crunching, I totally agree and I'm on the same page with you. To that, I have to add the fact that we are looking at algorithms that are being trained, and that is a significant concern in my field, because the question is, what are we training them with? And that's where the problem is. Many talk about big data, big data analysis, yeah, but different algorithms actually have different features, positives and the negatives. For example, we are going through a project right now that's sponsored by the National Institute of Health that pretty much explores the possibilities of algorithm in the context of uh, clinical care. So from that perspective, artificial intelligence to me is a tool. Mm -hmm. And we both were talking a little bit about that. I don't see it at, in this moment as a uh, collaborative. I see it as a tool. Yeah, I mean, that's, what, that's one of the things that I, uh, you know, one of the places where I feel the most comfortable with, uh, the, you know, trying to, you, to find the use for artificial intelligence. I am very, con I mean, as you were saying that we are, cons you know, one of the big concerns is what we trained this, crunching machines with. Um, the, I am also very concerned uh, 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 with how we represent them. So we, we tried very, very hard to make them look human. We have Sophia and we have, I don't know, like, I mean, there are so many, I'm not even going to uh, name them all. The one that came up in the screen uh, not, not so long ago was Sophia. Um, we all, I mean, why do we want to make them um, so anthropomorphic? Why do we want them to look like us? And I always find that really, really... And, and then run into all those ethical issues. Yeah, but, you know, the, the thing is that we want them to look like customers, to be like the perfect customer service representative. <laughs> and, and it's, you know, that look like us, and to me that's really unnerving because it's like having a slave, yeah? Mm -hmm. I do not want to be ordering anybody around. Like, go fetch me, my, it's like, mm, no, don't go fetch me anything. And so. from my perspective, I don't want to look at them as an individual, at, at least not yet. I'm, I'm not there yet, and that could be my limitation. But I arrived to AI, as I was sharing with you, because I was looking for a real solution to a real problem. And that problem is prevention of cardiovascular risk. So in my own research and in my own work, I didn't arrive to AI because it's AI. I arrived to it because the solutions, the analytical solutions at my disposal were not sufficient to solve a problem, a real one. Not an imaginary problem, a real one. And with that, we arrived to AI and the potential of AI. But again, we need to look at, I look at it as a tool because I look at it in the context of what you actually coined as the toolbox. Yeah, yeah. I have a toolbox. I have AI with a bunch of different algorithms that I use to see which one is best suited for my clinical problem alongside analytical intelligence, which is not AI, which is not trained. It's purely mathematical. How do I use that in my own work? Well, just imagine, if you are a physician and you have a patient walking into your office for the first time, you have not seen the physician, you have not seen the patient, you don't know anything about the patient, you just have a chart with some basic physiological measurements. What are you going to do? Are you going to trust perhaps a deep AI learning algorithm? that's looking at a population level health? Or are you going to say, you know what, it's a little risky. What I'm going to do, I'm actually going to focus on an analytical algorithm that has a knowledge-based library that contains guidelines put in place by the medical association for this particular situation. And through our experience and through my own work, Obviously, the latter is what a physician would choose 
if he or she would see a patient for the first time in, in the office. Yeah. And then the, the move, something that is interesting actually in terms of the conversation with you is to be talking about very concrete case, uh, a very, very concrete case and not about data in the abstract. You know, like we are talking about intelligence in the abstract and data in the abstract and processes in the abstract. What is that data? What are those processes? What do they represent? And I guess probably as an artist, issues of representation are, are quite important to me. And what kind of, I, my feeling at least is that um, when we don't view artificial intelligence and processes as processes, but as some kind of like magical thing, like self-thinking entities, we are slapping them together. We're like creating this bind with our image of the future and our, it's a lot of things that maybe Marcus was bringing about, like um, horror vacui, ideas of God, um, a sense of general lack, um, and, you know, you bind it together with this um, <laughs> magically solving, this thing that is going to all of a sudden wake up and be able to solve world hunger and so on. Um, but when I look at the kind of, um, images of the future that, that tend to be um, presented within this frame of thinking, it's, it's a future that I, found that I find incredibly disturbing because it tends to be um, a first world future, you know? Like when I see that it's a future that represents a sliver of the population. It's a future that actually, I'm sorry to say, it looks a lot like this room. <laughs> and it doesn't look at all like the place that I come from. And I come from Mexico, so as it was, it was said, and I, that to me is really unsettling because I see that, the, the, you know, like this kind of like magical idea of the future does not take into account basically 90% of the present, and that's a future I do not want to live in. So a lot of my engagement with modes of technology is kind of like trying to produce the future that I'm interested on. Um, and and how, that's what I was like talking about uh, uh, before with ideas of the um, digital presence, what is digital obesity, what is digital, on, um, you know, digital malnourishment, um, and how to make sure that this, um, whatever production of the future is uh, somewhat, not it's not only about gender representation, it's like you, we can say yes, like AI is coded or, uh, I mean, most software is coded by a majority of uh, um, men, but it's also about how to make sure that it's, it's not just about who is behind, but it's what kind of images do we, do we uh, put in front. Um, I don't know, I could also find very strange that in terms of coding, you would have so, so, so much um, coding happening in India and in um, Asia, and yet the the, that's on the back end and what's on the front end continues to be this kind of incredibly homogeneous um, narrow sliver of, uh, it's something that I, that I call uh, uh, a narrow totality. Yeah? It's like a total view of what universal means um, and yet it's a universe that only contains uh, uh, a, very, a very close set of terms. Yeah. So if we were to bring it into the reality of today, my particular interest is in solving a problem, not created one, creating one or not trying to force a solution into a problem. What's quite prevalent in the AI world right now is what I call siloism. And that has to do with the fact that you have cliques of scientists and developers that are proponents of particular AI venues. Unfortunately, in medicine, that may work in some other fields, but it doesn't work in medicine. Medicine, as most of you know or realize, it's to some level still an art. Uh, the humanity needs to be there. The, inter the human interaction needs to be there. So from that perspective, we cannot deal with one unique form of an algorithm that can fit a very complex medical problem. We need to look at a hybridized approach. We need to look at what the problem is 
and then determine what the best solution is. In our work, we actually look at a number of different algorithms that fit certain components of the clinical process that solves one step of that clinical process. So I, I'm, I'm trying to bring to your attention the limiting component of AI and the fact that human creativity that art that perhaps we don't know exactly how to explain, and I have a question for, for uh, Julieta in just one second, operates. And we were in your studio in Berlin when we started this conversation, and at one point we were talking about your work, and, so, and I probed you and I asked, how are you able to explain every single step of your thinking process the ideation component before you start the project. And you said that sometimes yes, sometimes no. So there is that mystery that... I mean, but that's, that's something that I guess it's, I don't know if it's true for, for all artists, but for me it is that I am a fairly well articulate person, but um, if I can articulate fully an idea, then I do not need to make a work because for me, my work is in a space that, that is beyond language. It's not something, if I can solve it with words, I need not to, to go to my studio and labor into making an artwork. That's, uh, that, that belongs to a different realm. So that's why I fail fantastically at the grant applications because somebody tells me, you know, uh, a demand is like, what is the work going to be? And I always, I'm very sincere and I say, I have no clue. When it's done, I will tell you everything about it, but not before I make it. So I never get any grants. Um, the, but the, and I mean, like that's that's a kind of um, you know, like it's it's very funny because um, I mean, like when it comes to, but in the same way that I don't get grants because I cannot say what I'm going to make, is that they people don't. It, it's very unreliable. Yeah, it's like not. Uh, and I think this is the same kind of uh, just to start bridging into this idea of uh, fear and so on. Um, um, we want things that are very um, reliable and structured and, and so the idea of, uh, you know, me getting money to make God knows what, it's like, no, it's like she's not going to get any money to make God knows what because we don't know what that is. And um, when, um, when artificial intelligence is uh, this or an algorithm or uh, any kind of process like that is described as a black box, there is this big thing of I do not know how this works and then I am not so comfortable dealing with it. Right, but remember we, start, we started this conversation via Zoom yeah. just a few weeks ago, and the entire concept of the black box is something that we want to challenge you, the audience, with, because truly, anatomically and physiologically, our own brain is still a black box. We do understand certain processes, but we don't have it mapped. It. It's not mapped completely. So we accept as humans that we carry a black box, but we don't have the same standard towards an AI, an algorithm that's still a black box. To some extent uh, that that, that's something that is very interesting to me, and um, I think perhaps you have a comment that you want to share with us, a short one, so we can very continue. Short, because it, it makes me think that, yes, I completely agree with our brain is a black box, and how do we actually make that turn in a way that's even appropriate in this moment for us? You know, like, that we could like look back and tell, and actually, yeah, when we do this, it is so difficult for us. We, 
Yeah, so I'll stop you there so we can continue with our conversation. I'm sure we'll have an extensive discussion on this. Uh, not a problem, but there are a couple of things that I want to mention. First of all, I am with Marcus. If there are any camps in the audience, I'm in the Marcus camp. Uh, because in my opinion, if you consider yourself or your brain a black box, then fear leads to trying to control everything around you that is not a black box. So, so, so you, you, you are trying to be so specific and structure everything else to pretty much fool yourself that the reality is not the reality. And I'm going to leave it to that. I'm sure it's going to be a long conversation afterwards with possibly a lot of wine. And I'm going to return to Julieta so we can continue our subject. Fear. Uh, fear. Well, I mean, it, but you know, it's, uh, like if we try to think about the, I think a lot of fear comes from the, the representations, again, um, that we have made of um, artificial intelligences, right? We have a, um, uh, Alpha 60, which is this uh, um, Alpha Bill uh, Godard, like the, this French uh, artificial intelligence from the 60s, which is a totalitarian, um, uh, kind of like what the Chinese thing uh, was being descri described earlier, but without the game re uh, reward points, the, co um, the loyalty points, no? Um, then there is, I don't know, Skynet, the quite a famous one, and uh, there is this, I mean, like this whole um, um, thing of uh, fearing this thing that we are making that has no use for human life, right? Um, on the one hand, and that's one. I don't know. I don't know if that's just an, um, an uh, how do you say, an ontological fear, or if it's also something like it's a way of extrapolating the idea of basically being afraid of losing our jobs and what happens to, but, th but that's not even a fear of artificial intelligence, that's the fear of automation in general. So what happens with like base, the jobs that are, um, um, you know, the jobs that are reliant on manual skill, of course, started going to machines and then there is some, and that's so the blue collar industries take a giant toll because the cashier is, now you have a self-checkout machine and instead of having a, uh, I don't know, a masseuse, now you can get a massage chair, and so on. Um, what so happens now, just, just to finish, um, what happens with artificial intelligence is that all of a sudden the white collar jobs seem to be at risk. And that's when a lot of um, upheaval seems to be um, appearing. You know? Yeah, so from that perspective, uh, we were talking last night and uh, I think it's a situation of being at an inflection point as a civilization. And we've been dragged by, by our hair kicking and screaming to this point. Hopefully, we will be able to continue those conversations and realize what is happening to us as a society. Changes are at foot. And we need to think how we want to restructure our civilization, our culture, our society, based on what's happening, because we cannot just back out of this, it's happening. With that perspective, I think it's also important to realize what uh, the artificial intelligence is doing to uh, the labor market and the distribution of wealth. And that is something that has been brought up in many conversations um, through media as well as various conferences. How do you feel, the, uh, how, how do you feel about the distribution uh, of wealth and what's happening? I mean, I, I, I'm going to try to separate that from artificial intelligence a little bit. The, in terms of um, uh, job threatening, somebody was bringing up uh, earlier today that there was this uh, artificial intelligence painted portrait of some random fake nobility figure sold that Christie's smashing uh, the auction estimates. And um, then I think, okay, I'm an artist. Do I feel threatened by artificial intelligence? Is, am I going to lose my job now? <laughs> um, and I mean, like, I don't know, you know, like, because at the end of the day, I don't want to fear artificial intelligence per se. What I, that's blaming things into this abstract notion is also 
a very good way of deflecting responsibility is not the artificial intelligence, it's who is making the artificial mm -hmm. intelligence. It's not how, it's, uh, what, it's about solving problems, but what problems are we feeding to it? It's, uh, it makes, uh, you know, it makes uh, samples, it crunches a lot of images together. Who is putting those images inside? What mm -hmm. are these images of? And so, I mean, at some point we're going to, you know, like this, get to the point where these machines training machines and so on. But while we have an injurance, you know, I take issue with the human component in the, in the creation of these processes. So. I completely agree. So what's happening in medicine, I'm not sure what's happening um, in the European Union, uh, but in the US, in terms of medicine, there is what we call usual care. So that's your basic care that is offered through various medical insurance resources. And for patients with chronic disease, uh, it's very strict. You can see your physician every three to four months for a follow-up, evaluation of your treatment, etc. So in that context, what we are trying to do with the artificial intelligence, we are trying to change the entire concept of care management. How do you think physicians feel about that? You hit them with that and they're going to say, and they are saying, and I felt the same way in the beginning, what are you doing now? Um, so I need to find another job or retire or what am I going to do with my time if you are taking over this entire management of clinical care? The reality that we're, experience, we're experiencing now, at least at University of California, San Francisco, is just the opposite. That fear had dissipated. We've been using this system for about a half a year now. And we are all realizing that we are saving time. We are spending more time with our patients. We are actually having a conversation with our patients. So from that perspective, we feel that the AI is pretty much, pretty much changing the attitude towards uh, clinical care in general. Take, take, taking that to Africa, where we also operate uh, in clinical care, chronic uh, clinical care management, non-communicable diseases, which is cardiovascular disease uh, for um, most of the regions, we do the same thing. We are trying to understand the problem on the ground and we are developing a solution that's AI contingent, which helps us solve that particular problem. I mean, I think that's uh, something that, that's interesting. Of course, that's like the case of medicine, which is, uh, you know, it, it's, it works for the medical profession. It may not work that well for people that work as, as cashiers at McDonald's. I can spend more time with my customers. I don't know that the customers want to spend more time with me if I'm a cashier at McDonald's. Um, but the, the thing is that what is, you know, like then, as you were saying, like how does one develop um, or rethinks a social structure that actually allows for a repurposing right. it's, of it's, collective time. Right, it's the labor market that needs to be addressed in, in, in the context of, of artificial intelligence. It's not my job is disappearing. What can I do to repurpose my time? That would be beneficial to myself, my family, the society, etc. I mean, I don't know if that's a solution also that can be at addressed at an individual level. Oh, not at all. That's actually something that, it, that has to do with modes of governance and mm -hmm. modes of structuring um, civil society mm -hmm. and so on. And it requires, again, like this idea of um, taking responsibility. Um, the, I mean, like, that's like the one issue that I have with the full gamification of society is that it absolves you from responsibility because it's based on reward points. So um, if there is a way of baking in the sense of um, social responsibility within this uh, 21st century new visions of what the present and the future can be, um, yeah, I mean, like, I don't know, one, you know, one does what one can, at least in imaginations and visualizations of reality, but yeah. And going back to fear, I noticed that usually fear stems from being afraid to step into the unknown, to step into a situation that you don't have it fully mapped. And uh, 
somehow your brain says, uh, you know what, this is a 50-50 or a 40-60 or a 30-70, you know, lose-win situation. And I don't want to take that chance. What if we remove that constraint and pretty much slam the door open and just step into the unknown to see what happens? What the opportunities could be in that circumstance? Uh, to me, thinking, overthinking it truly doesn't lead to, to success, but that's just my own professional experience. I mean, when, you know, like I, I, I see what you're saying, and I think that can work, again, as, at a personal level, but when at a social, at a society level, and security becomes a big concern, so as a, an entire society is not going to gleefully walk into the unknown because that's like a George Bataille idea of, of the social, and people still want to have a security, uh, a sense of security. So it, it's also some, like the responsibility, again, of like how to provide that, like the, you know, like this uh, sense of security and without it being conservative thinking and without being afraid of the unknown. I mean, like it's, a, it's like, a, um, like threading the delicate waters there. there. It's possible, but it's not so easy, I guess. Um, I, I think, and that's just a personal opinion, that it starts with each of us. If we were to rely on governments, well, we see where the governments of the world are today. No, but you know, governments, I think it's different from governance. I'm not talking about like having the, the um, a faith in the Democratic or Republican or Angela Merkel or uh, anything. Or <laughs> or I'm not mentioning that name. It's uh, out of my vocabulary. Um, but it's like rather ideas of, uh, of governance, self-governance, community governance, um, and how to kind of structure the system um, around us. So, that, I mean, like there are nets and networks and things that are not just individually based. That there is, uh, it's a little bit like a more holistic approach. Mm -hmm. And it, you, I mean, you would see it in medicine. You cannot treat one area of a body without taking into account, you know, the, the side effects of a medication yeah. and things like that. So I'm, I'm referring more to that kind okay. of thing. I think maybe we can yeah, drag right. those guys in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm actually afraid of that the human being is not taking enough advantages out of artificial intelligence. <laughs> so my fear is not about artificial intelligence. And there are two things that I really like what you mentioned. W one thing is that we need to write a new narrative. And this is also a little bit what I meant before, whether we can offend robots and why do we actually need to redefine humanity. And uh, the other thing is that you said that AI is a tool, and I think this is exactly all about that. It's an augmented services on the human being. It's not about us being redundant, it's about certain tasks being redundant, obviously also certain jobs, but this is a development what we need to do. And therefore, the fear I have is that if we have too much fear, because people don't know, and we can't, we can't stop this development. The development is being done anyway, and this is my biggest. And then I just want to share with you quickly something that Funny Wise just came in half an hour ago. Uh, an association that is being built now calls for humanity. Sorry, I have to put my glasses. for what? He calls for humanity. I was just approached by them, actually now, uh, half an hour ago. It's AI safety, a community about being a supporter of independent audit. So it's like, it's like an international audit for AI. And what they want to uh, have the audit on is about ethics, Bias, privacy, trust, that means control, safety, accountability, and transparency, and cybersecurity. So I think it's very interesting. And what they just said is that they are in discussion with PwC, Accenture, and Ernst and Young. <laughs> so just to share with you the latest news I just got. What happened in mid of 19th century with the industrial revolution. All of the occultism came out in the 
let's say, European society, Russian society. But there are many different theories about this, how the occultism was a reaction to the um, Industrial Revolution. Also, any type of esoterics, which are mm, still on today. So, is there any comparable fears with artificial intelligence, like those fears from the mid of the 19th century? Um, that, that and the result of it. That is a very loaded question, and there is no right answer, I think. Um, but I mean, like, I think that art, it's uh, like in a different sense, because um, our frame of belief has uh, uh, evolved quite a bit in the last 100 years, 150 years. But uh, I think there is a kind of uh, a fear of, uh, of, be, of creating some kind of malevolent sentience, you know, like creating <laughs> actually our uh, being the architects of our uh, downfall, which, you know, I mean, like, I'm sure we absolutely are the architects of our downfall, but that has more to do with an abuse of fossil fuels than, and, uh, uh, you know, ecological disasters than it has to do with any uh, Skynet entity. I mean, for me, um, uh, you know, the main, when I see that the, this is like some kind of cognitive dissonance. On the one hand, there are all these misplaced fears. There are plenty of things to be afraid right now, but they are all being placed on this crunching <laughs> device that is basically used to gather the, except in the cases of like medical um, applications and things like that that are quite concrete, is something to do with internet use and how to sell people, I don't know, potato chips or sneakers or something. Yeah, it's like pretty banal use of technology, which is sad, uh, in my opinion. Um, the, so it's I have a yes. comment whenever you're... Yep. Okay, so uh, let me just give you this anecdote. We were at the European Society of Cardiology in Munich this year, at the end of August, and we were discussing AI and the implications of AI and all that good stuff. So the concern of the clinician is the fact that we have this black box, so when a decision comes out of the black box, it's not really completely justified. And then we were talking about regulatory bodies in the US and EU, and the majority of the clinicians astonishingly said, oh, if it's regulated, then I'll believe it. I don't care what's in the black box anymore. If FDA put its stamp of approval or the CE mark put its stamp of approval on this, no problem, I'm going to adopt it in clinical care. So that fear that was the resistance against using it because they didn't know what was inside it went away. Uh, just a quick one. I mean, I remember this term that Edward Snowden used in 2013 in regard to surveillance and the notion was turnkey tyranny. Say it again. <coughs> turnkey tyranny meaning that there is a system in place that if it's democratically regulated can be used for good ends, for example, to find terrorists, I mean, the surveillance system the US has, or to work against organized crime, uh, etc. Uh, but in, in an ideal world, we all know it's not actually that way. Um, but once you have, let's say, like in Brazil uh, uh, tomorrow, a fascist ruled, uh, uh, um, elected into Bolsonaro. power who already says, I will use all the power of the military, that means whatever um, electronic means you have to analyze the society will be used. That is the notion. I mean, that for me is the biggest fear, actually. And, and we can have all kinds of audits or all kinds of regulations if if we build a machine that hasn't some kind of wegfahrsperre, you know, some kind of thing, I don't know the English word for that, what is that actually? Uh, that blocks your what? Mm -hmm. That blocks your what? Blocks your car. Ah. Yeah, I think there, there also have to be technological answers, not only political and juridical answers, that's what I'm saying. No, I mean, but, you know, completely, I like the thing, I mean, just to bring something, um, but it's, there's also has to be some kind of, uh, like there's like like a um, like agency in between these answers. Yes, like the implementation of like what is the implementation of these solutions? And let's talk about something that we are all experiencing right now. 
which is the, G, the GDPR um, regulation, yeah? Like uh, there was this law about the use of data in the European Union, so now every time you open a website, it gives you this super annoying box that says we use cookies, you need to agree. So in all honesty, how many of you deal with the use of cookies and how many of you just go like, oh, for fuck's sake, again, and just click accept, <laughs> you know? That's, uh, so there, that, that was a, a chance for agency there. It granted clumsy, clunky, um, uh, ill thoughts, everybody. We, all of us that do internet, we had a moment of absolute panic at the thought of like, wow, okay, so what's going to happen? And then what happened is just this, adding this uh, incredibly annoying step in there of like, I have to click accept because I want to read the news. I have to click accept because I'm looking for a recipe for paprika, and, you know, or because I want, I mean, what have you. So, um, and you know, and then you have to think, okay, when I'm doing this, you know, like the, there's the potential, Imagine that you are in Brazil and you're doing that and every time you click accept because you're reading gossip uh, websites, you are potentially giving Bolsonaro some of your information. I mean like, Ger you know, people in Germany are kind of like, well, we're more familiar than most with surveillance issues. Um, so, uh, and I think that's why actually people in Germany, um, are, it's probably one of the societies that has the most, um, concrete reactions uh, uh, against and to prevent and the, but you know like I think we can it's very hard to put together this thing of like oh, because of how ban how banal it is you know that just 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 to finish um, that that it ends up being used most of the time to gather consumer preferences in order to market things made you know like cheap crap made in China. So you, you know, okay, so you are l looking on the internet for, some, you know, I don't know, you're writing to somebody about sunglasses, and then all of a sudden, you, in your uh, uh, internet browser, you start looking at Ray-Ban ads, and of course it's not coincidence, it's, uh, it's this banality at work, and you stop thinking about the kind of um, darker uh, effects that it can have. Now, how do we break out of that cycle? That's not, artificial intelligence is not going to do it for us, right? That's something, like, that's us. So. so I'm going to go back to what I was saying about this fear component. And I find it that every time we fear something, we try to fence it. We try to make rules around it. We try to, establish committees, we try to have policies around the issue. And that creates a bureaucratic component that's actually slowing down innovation. And I wonder if there are any opinions on this particular subject from the audience. Marcus? <coughs> no, a very simple question in my case. Um, but um, you know, the, there's this classical uh, distinction between fear and anxiety. Fear and, and what? Um, an anxiety. anxiety. So, Furcht und Angst in, in German. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, do you make a differentiation in your vocabulary? I'm sorry? Uh, do you ex do, are you making yourself a differentiation between these two concepts? Fear and an anxiety? Can you define them? I cannot answer the, the question unless I understand your definition of the two. The, uh, the object of fear is defined, more or less defined, and more or less known, and the object of anxiety is nothing is itself. It's this is a classical definition given by Heidegger, for example, in Being in Time. And, uh, and, uh, I mean, like, according to your definition, it's much more uh, anxiety-based then, because it's just this, the thought that we are creating this malevolent engine that will be our doom, but we do not know what is malevolent. You know, it's kind of like a, a, the place where we are throwing in all this, the, these images of the, of the worst things, that, because it's not capable of remorse, because it's not capable of empathy, because it's not capable of... Uh, you know, it doesn't have a soul, it doesn't have a conscious, it doesn't have a... So that's, the, you know, like, that's like the, I'm talking right. about like the popular culture image. Right, of, uh, right. I, I would go um, oddly with fear. I, I think it's an inherent sentiment 
of fear that uh, emerges and establishes itself in creating those fences. Th th this entire, let me control the environment and that's not necessary anxiety. Let me control everything subconsciously knowing that I cannot control myself. So that's my opinion. But isn't in that case, I mean, if you, you seem to differ in that sense that you would call it more fear, but Julieta tends more to the anxiety word. But in both cases, isn't it the case that in a way, I, I, it, it's a placeholder for, mm -hmm. because let's face it, even so if everyone agrees, this is the thing that rules our world already now, but definitely for the next 10 years. People don't know that much about it. And if you read the discussions, it's still, as we learned today, it's still a kind of like, oh, what exactly is it? Shouldn't we start with defining what runs as an artificial intelligence? And 10 years ago, the artificial intelligence meant something completely different mm -hmm. than we are talking about today. And Raphael was talking about the general artificial intelligence, which is different concept to just data crunching machines that are usually referred to when we talk about AI and the places where it replaces simple cognitive functions of people working on numbers, like an insurance company or something. And so in a way, I would tend more to Julieta's, that it, it's an anxiety because it's not defined what we are afraid of. And it's also, as with many technologies, it's about it's about the use of this technology that we might tend to be afraid of. But in the case of e AI, what was interesting the whole day, I think, is also this kind of like, that you almost treat it like an individual. You are afraid of AI, whatever that is, rather um, than being afraid of the people using it for whatever. Yeah, uh, in my perspective, the fear component has to do, is always associated with fear of the unknown. And unknown is not an entity. So, and that's how I express myself. Perhaps if we were to yeah. debunk that, it may lead to this anxiety. I don't mm. think that we have a separation here. It's just a perceptive approach to a concept, which can be different and all parties can be right. And in my perception, fear is fear of the unknown. Yeah, uh, uh, just to comment, um, uh, fear is actually um, one of the basic emotions. It's a physical manifestation in the body, just like joy or anger. Um, anxiety is more a feeling. It's attached to a certain uh, intellectual engagement, uh, probably co continuing from the emotion. Uh, I think both are, in a way, a part of the general dramatization of AI in the society. because. It's fear, maybe fear of the unknown, but it's also fear of someone te is taking my place. So it's this replacement fear also. I think it's very important in the AI so civilization paradigm. The, I call it the alien cosmology because also it, it allows to just not be in this legal concern, framing things in box. It's crazy enough so that there is space for the irrational, there is space for the non, the unclear. Uh, so the attempt of building reasoning, such as the one I shared, is also to allow, like, okay, let's get a bit of freestyle around that, because it, we're not going to be able to, you know, enclosure it. As you said, I think it's uh, also what you said is actually a very good example of why it should not be enclosed, because we our consciousness continuously want to grasp things, uh, pro produce consistency, or, uh, create a ground so we feel certain, we can engage. So this is what we constantly do, but in fact, at the back of our mind is making plenty of small arbitrage of like, oh, we, uh, I'm against uh, uh, um, data or collection, but at the same time, I see that uh, in a way I don't care at all and I just click uh, one more time and, you know, this trial error principle, like, oh, I just one, twice, three times, and then you don't even think, think about it a minute. So you, the human mind is actually 
lying constantly, as you said, and uh, uh, data scientists and the people who are uh, building uh, artificial intelligence, they also work on the fact that the human mind is constantly lying to itself. And even though you are against certain thing in your corner, you're going to do your astrological thema and your AI diagnostic and your, you know, you are in, 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 in the intimacy of your private life. So the human mind is very versatile and also um, are uh, kind of like in this uh, uh, dual discourse and uh, paradoxical uh, rationality. So I think uh, so fear is part of that yeah. kind of like th the, the fabrication of a certain thrill also around AI because we scared, but at the same time we are appealed and oh, you overcome your fear. It's great feeling. Okay, so imagine removing all that noise from your head and using the energy that you are wasting through those internal conversations for something good, whatever good means to you. I, 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 find, I find it exhausting when those conversations, anxiety, fear, whatever you want to call it, go on into my head, consciously and subconsciously. And imagine freeing up that time, freeing up that energy and repurposing it for what is meant. And that is up to you, whatever that is meant. I pretty much have been practicing that for a while and it's mind boggling to be able to detach and really focus on what is important to you. With the, with the concept of not fearing or not being anxious about the unknown, just stepping into the unknown. I would like. I guess it's part of being an artist. Oh, so I too. mean, no, but you know, it's also something. You know, I mean, like, I can respond. Um, I can think about the, uh, you know, like going back to this idea of like what what is one afraid of when one says that one is afraid of artificial intelligence? Yeah, like and and um, again, I think it's like a fantastic catch-all place for. Fear of a totalitarian state, fear of ecological destruction, fear of overpopulation, fear of lack of resources, and, and you know, it just catches everything and allows us to uh, create a projection of this like very dystopian uh, future that is actually which is not of our making. It was made by this artificial intelligence thing. We didn't do it. Yeah. So it's a really <laughs> good way of um, uh, embodiment of uh, these kind of like uh, the terrible realities while absolving ourselves from any Good point. Uh, responsibility on, on its <laughs> making. So that's why it's a seductive image, you know. It's, that's why it's so present. I mean, I can think of uh, very concrete uh, fears, you know, like, like Bolsonaro in Brazil, for example, and his whole like necro capitalistic thinking of saying, I'm just going to open the Amazon to Canadian mining companies. And it's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, I, I, it's like, basically that's my death sentence or like my child's death sentence, you know, like that's, uh, and, and, and that's not, you know, like, and I mean, like there is um, a kind of enabling that goes on, but it's never going to be this, uh, as, as big as, uh, as that embodiment is, is composed of many, many banal gestures. And, and I mean, like, I don't know how does, is, is the way to change our frame of mind the same as it was to train uh, ourselves to not use plastic bags, but to start using, um, you know, taking our bag to the supermarket again, or to not use plastic straws. Do we have to really start from, and we probably do, you know, to have mm -hmm. to start from these very small places. Um, to, you know, it's because we are never going to fight Skynet. And Something there has else. to be a law about the plastic bags. Yeah. And California got it a few years ago, and you pay 20 cents per bag. I'm sure the same thing yeah, here yeah. in the EU. So uh, this is what we are occupying our time with. I would actually like to turn this a bit into a more positive discussion uh, because I think fear is something that we feel because we don't see any alternatives. Say that again, I couldn't hear you, sorry. Fear is something because we can't see any alternatives. Why am I afraid of losing my job? It's probably because I don't see an alternative. 
And one of at least our aims for Swiss Cognitive is about talking about practical use cases. Where can we use AI? How can we support the human being? And just to give you a few examples, how we could or how we should uh, deal with those problems. For example, taxi driver, truck driver, train, uh, how do you say driver, however. We need them, we still need them, but we shouldn't still? educate a new generation of truck drivers. So those who we have can still stay until they gonna be redundant because they're gonna be in a certain uh, uh, time uh, in the future. By then, we might have another idea where we can put them, but at least we won't have new ones. So this is just one example, like a trivial one. Then looking into healthcare, what we discussed a lot. I mean, obviously, there is also white collar workers who will have redundant tasks. Now, every one of us thinking about going out of the office or the, the hospital or wherever we work and thinking about what didn't I do what I love to do in my job just because of administrative stuff, reoccurring stuff. So these are all the things that we can actually put into a machine. And in healthcare, just also here an example, normally the nurses does not have enough time Unfortunately, I had to stay quite a long time in hospital with my daughter. And believe me, I would be the happiest mother if a nice robot going to bring her the medicine. But if she, she has fear, if she is afraid, she can't sleep, or she needs someone to sit next to her for a half an hour to support her, then I would be the first mother saying, hey, please just send the robot to bring them in a nice way the medicine, and they have enough time on the human level. And I think we need to talk more about the chances. This is like really trivial ones. We have more complicated, we have the downside, we have the risks. But even a painter, if you would tell a painter, hey, look at the drones. Why don't you just say, hey, let's have a new business case. I'm buying drones. You can tell me next morning I would like to have my house in pink with happy birthday because my, I don't know, daughter has birthday. So he doesn't need the construction. He just need a graphic designer and he need drones. He does it overnight. And the next day, if you want, paint it bl uh, uh, bl uh, white again. So I don't know how realistic this is in the next 12 months, but this is gonna happen. So even a painter can disrupt his business, but we have to, encourage them to think in a disruptive way and not to fear them all the time and say, okay, all the negative sides. So I just ask all of you, start to think in a disruptive way and encourage the people, where do they have a chance? I want to, to, to say that I can't quite agree there because I think if, uh, again, the, there are larger issues of responsibility, right? If I am creating a system that is effectively going to generate a large amount of obsolescence for my fellow human beings, I should also participate because that's my responsibility in creating you know, systems that make sure it's not to say, think about all the great things you can do with your time. You, can, you don't have any food, you know, you cannot take your children to the doctor, but you have tons of free time. Be disruptive with that free time, you know. It's, I don't know what, you could become a robber, or dedicate yourself to vandalism, um, traffic drugs, you know, like that's pretty disruptive, I, I guess. Kidding. Um, no, but you know, like I say, if something is going to render a hundred people obsolete, then you have to figure out at the same time where are you going to play, place them, you know? The expense is too high. So when I see these kind of things happening, I'm going to be quite happy, but otherwise I can't, uh, I can't go there. I and want to also make a comment on that point. Um, and you are a great mother to your children, I'm sure, and you feel comfortable with the approach of having an artificial intelligence in the form of a robot or any other entity to soothe your child if he or she is hospitalized. But from my experience in the ICU, 
as well as outside in regular clinical care, those children want the warm touch of a human being, whether it's a nurse, mom, or somebody from the family. And that's just my experience. I think there was a misunderstanding. What Dalit said was she, she would like a robot to bring the medicine if that frees up time for the nurse who never okay. has the time to sit next to the bed of a patient yeah. and hold the So I completely forward. agree. But coming back also to what Julieta said, I think this was one of the reasons for finding each other here today was the need to add another perspective to talking about AI other than business and tech people. Because it is not, yes, there is a lot of business chances with AI, but I think we, this is something that's happening. But the need for a humanist approach, the need for some philosophical impact, some sociological impact, and to realize in a way, I mean, this was the quote that was in the theme for the conference today that we gave, is today, from AI, from tech, and from business, they are not just doing business or creating tech, they are make, doing politics. They are creating economies, and they are kind of like setting what the world is going to be. And I, one of the arguments of this day today was, we should be part of that discussion from other sides than just the tech side and just mm -hmm. the business side, because it can add something that, I'm not even saying that that might not be helpful also for the business side even, but these factors need to be considered and looked at, and as you said, Julieta, if, if something is going to fundamentally change the way how work is organized in this world, and we are already living in a super unequal world, then we all should try to be part of that discussion from an artistic point of view, from a philosophical point of view, from a sociological point of view, for wherever we try to engage. <coughs> Um, I agree that um, there are many good uses and maybe even excellent uses for AI in the context of uh, care and so-called reproductive labor, uh, you know, care of all kinds. Um, but this is actually not a technological question, it's, it's a political question uh, in regard to what kind of universal health care we have or don't have, meaning that if the... If the uh, healthcare is very basic or below basic, then that nurse will be laid off rather than uh, time being freed up for her. And um, sorry for being negative again. It's, I guess that's my nature. Um, um, I, I fear that um, uh, this is really about a, a, a strong push for creating uh, a political consensus that AI must not uh, uh, lay off people and leave bad conditions in place, meaning as in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a hospital, if you have, let's say, 200 people on staff and 50 are replaced in 20 years' time by AI, that the rest of them are still having the same amount of labor for the same ends, more or less, rather than actually a new, uh, more uh, um, sort of uh, nurturing or caring uh, um, possibilities being opened up. And the problem underlying that is that it's a long tradition in capitalism uh, that uh, so-called care work is not considered as valuable as so-called productive work. Um, I mean, you can go back to Karl Marx because it doesn't actually really address the problem. For him, even for him, work is productive labor. Uh, the whole concept of uh, so-called reproductive labor or caring labor doesn't even come into play, really. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, maybe in all the, of his writing there is this point, but as far as I know, there isn't. And people like Nina Power have pointed that out, that there is real work to be done in society to make clear this is not just this cheap labor, but that it should be um, not only well paid, but also um, implemented as something that becomes more and more central, just precisely because of technology also. Mm -hmm.